Well, good morning. Thanks so much for being with us this morning. Thanks, Marianne and Sandy for leading us, and Dan and the band for leading us in worship. Wasn't that a great time with God? Well, years ago, I climbed a mountain in Scotland called Shehalion. I love getting out in nature and uh, particularly love getting into the mountains. And Shehalion is one of the closest Munros to Edinburgh. It's just a couple of hours drive away. It's also one of the easiest Munros to climb, at least in theory. I should explain that uh, if you don't know, a Munro is a mountain in Scotland that is higher than 3,000 feet. Uh, So it's pretty common for the weather conditions at the top of a Munro to bear no resemblance whatsoever to the conditions on the ground at sort of sea level. Now, I was with a good friend of mine called Rob, and we set out from the car park at the foot of Shehalion, and we uh, started climbing. Now, it was a bit cloudy, but it was an otherwise pretty unremarkable March day. It wasn't, uh, wasn't especially wet or cold or windy. I suppose that would make it a pretty remarkable March day in Scotland, but it was quite a nice day. And um, as we started to climb, that just began to change a little bit. We noticed the clouds got a little bit heavier and um, the drizzle started. And before we knew it, the beautiful view that we'd been admiring down into the valley um, disappeared. We were enveloped in thick cloud And the wind started to pick up, and it started to whip heavy rain straight into our face. And as we continued to climb higher and higher, inevitably, the snow began to fall. And it was light at first, but inevitably, it got heavier and heavier. And soon we were trudging through deep snow, straight into the teeth of a blizzard. It was a complete whiteout, and visibility was, it was just horrendous. All we had was a map and a compass, and to be honest, we probably should have turned back right there and then, but we were young, and we didn't really think about the dangers involved, and we were really determined to get to the top of a Monroe that day, so we pressed on, but man, it was hard going. At one point, I distinctly remember turning around and uh, seeing Rob kind of emerging out of this sea of white with his head down, just taking one step after another. It really felt like we were on some kind of epic polar expedition. Now, uh, one of our members at King's Church, Ali Simpson, has actually spent time living at the South Pole. So once I'm done here, no doubt he will tell me that this was nothing like a polar expedition. But I'm telling you, at the time, I felt like Ernest Shackleton or Scott of the Antarctic. It was absolutely epic. And against the odds, we somehow found the summit and then made a hasty retreat back through the blizzard down to safety. Now, as I said, Shehalion is not a difficult mountain to climb, but my goodness, it was brutal that day. Despite the dreadful conditions, though, we came to no harm at all. The thing that really kept us safe was that we were both well-equipped. We had a compass, we had our map, we had plenty of food and water. But perhaps the most important thing, we had good hiking boots and we had uh, good thermal base layers to keep us warm. We had good waterproof jackets and trousers. We had excellent gloves and uh, hats. And when we set out at the start of the walk, most of those things were stuffed in my rucksack because I didn't think I'd be needing them. But man, I realized the importance that day of being dressed appropriately for the conditions can even save your life. As we got to the bottom of the mountain, we were just battered, as you can imagine. It it was hard to picture that we'd just been in a blizzard because it was pretty warm down the bottom of the mountain. It was was really quite a calm, nice day. And we encountered this young family walking in the opposite direction. There was a a mom, a dad, maybe two or three kids, I think. And each of them was wearing jeans and trainers. I'm pretty sure one of them even had shorts on. And they were laughing and they were joking. And the mum smiled at us and said, beautiful day, isn't it? I bet the view's great from the top. And Rob and I just kind of looked at one another and looked back at what they were wearing. And then we did our best to warn them about the tough conditions near the top of the mountain. Now, they smiled politely and 
you could tell they thought we were kind of overreacting and they carried on their way up the path. We warned them, but they, they didn't heed our warning. I hope they made it down safely that day. When you're climbing a mountain, if you're not clothed appropriately, you can get into trouble. And in his letter to the Ephesians, the Apostle Paul says that, spiritually speaking, life is exactly the same. In this passage we're looking at today, he warns us that conditions won't always be easy, and we need to clothe ourselves with Christ. The good news is that if you know Jesus, he has equipped you with everything you need to come through even the toughest of conditions safely. We're in a series right now called The Fight, looking at Ephesians chapter 6. So let's read from it now. It's the same passage we read with Dan last week, but we're going to be homing in on a different verse today. So we're going to start in verse 10. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all, to stand firm. Stand, therefore, having fastened on the belt of truth and having put on the breastplate of righteousness, and as shoes for your feet, having put on the readiness given by the gospel of peace. In all circumstances, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming darts of the evil one, and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God, praying at all times in the Spirit with all prayer and supplication. We're going to focus on one particular piece of armor today, the shield of faith. The verse 16 there says, In all circumstances, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming darts of the evil one. So what is this shield of faith and how do we use it? Well, let's look at what faith is. Put simply, faith is trusting God completely. It's trusting that he is who he says he is, that he has done for you what he says he has done for you, and that he will do what he says he will do. Hebrews 11 verse 1 says, Faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. That assurance that conviction is it's not just a feeling or an airy-fairy concept. It's something that we act on, something that we stand on. It's, it's like a skydiver's belief that when he jumps out of the plane, the parachute will open and it will be enough to keep him safe. God wants you to live in the good of the wonderful victory that he has won for you, that Jesus won for you on the cross. But the enemy wants to discourage you and deceive you and distract you from it. Faith is the antidote to his poison. The theologian John Stott put it like this, Faith lays hold of the promises of God in times of doubt and depression, and faith lays hold of the power of God in times of temptation. I wonder if you feel a bit under siege right now. Perhaps the enemy's been trying to make you doubt God's goodness or his strength or his love for you. Maybe he's been trying to drag you down into depression or anxiety, or perhaps he's drawn you into habits and behaviors that you know aren't right and aren't good for you. The lies, the temptations, these attacks of the enemy are the fiery darts that Paul mentions in verse 16, in the passage that we're looking at. God wants to remind you this morning that if you are a Christian, he has given you a shield of faith that is more than enough to fully protect you against these fiery darts. 
I say fully protect you because that is the picture that Paul is intending for you to have in your head. The type of shield that he's referring to is the large oblong shield used by Roman infantrymen. I know our student pastor at King's, Nathaniel Smith, loves it when preachers explain Roman armor in detail. So here is a picture of what a Roman soldier's shield looked like. It's about 1.2 meters high, and it's designed to cover the whole body from attack. And you know, it's it's the same with our shield of faith. It covers us completely. So, How do we use the shield of faith? I'm going to make three points. We use it swiftly, continuously, and together. Firstly, we must use the shield of faith swiftly. By that, I mean it is our first line of defense against enemy attack. Soldiers don't pick up their shields halfway through the battle. We must employ our shield early. Look at Paul's description of the flaming darts of the enemy for a moment. In his day, armies would have archers who would dip their arrows in pitch and then set that on fire before they released their arrows. The idea was that not only could you cause damage with the arrow itself, but if it hit a wooden shield or a piece of clothing, it could set it on fire. And that fire would spread quickly through the ranks of the opposing army, causing multiple casualties. Now, to counteract this, Roman soldiers, the type of soldiers that Paul has in mind when he's writing this passage, they would cover their shields in animal hide, and they would then dip them in water. So when the flaming arrow hit their shield, it would be extinguished immediately. So here's the idea Paul is getting at. The enemy loves to throw accusations, malicious thoughts, or temptations at you. Given enough time and oxygen, these become more and more destructive, and they risk injuring not just you, but other people around you. I'm sure we've all experienced something like this. We may have a seemingly innocuous thought, something like, we're not a great Christian compared to someone else, or something like that. Now, we know that the Word of God says that everyone has fallen short of the glory of God, and that all of us are saved by his grace, that there's no hierarchy in our standing before God. But it's easy to allow a little lie like that to take root in our hearts, to find its target. Before long, we're comparing ourselves to lots of other people, and we're feeling bad about ourselves, and we start living life as though it's a competition, and we forget that these are brothers and sisters around us. And we are in the family of God together. This is not a competition. We might even start to feel guilty because we're feeling bad about ourselves, and that forces us, or causes us rather, to to start withdrawing from God. And and we think he's disappointed with us, so we we don't pray or read our Bible, all these things that do us so much good. We don't do those as much as we we were doing. And we stop enjoying his grace, and things can just spiral out of control really quickly unless we employ the shield of faith. I know I've been surprised in myself over these last few months at how easily little thoughts and worries can become huge things in my head. You know, we live in a time when it's easy to feel disconnected. Disconnected from God, maybe? Disconnected from one another? Misunderstandings can arise so easily because we just can't see one another as much as we'd like. And make no mistake, the enemy wants you to doubt God's good plans for you, and he wants to sow derision in your relationships. Don't give him any room to do that. The best time to put out a fire is when it's barely begun. We must be vigilant in not allowing the enemy's lies to linger in our mind. 2 Corinthians 10 verse 5 instructs us to take every thought captive. That is, don't let a thought run wild and free in your mind that you know is contrary to what is true of God or what he says about you or what he says about other people. Jesus faced this exact same challenge when Satan tempted him 
after he'd gone 40 days and nights with no food in the wilderness. Can you imagine the state of exhaustion that Jesus must have been in after fasting for that long? But he remained vigilant and he extinguished the lies of the enemy with faith in the word of God and the promises of God. Over and over again, when Satan tempted him, Jesus simply responded, it is written and then quoted scripture. The fiery darts of the enemy were extinguished before they'd even really landed. Jesus gave no opportunity for fire to take hold and spread, and we can do the same when we use the shield of faith. God can restore our wrong ways of thinking when we ask for his truth and when we apply that to our lives. Secondly, we must use the shield of faith continuously. We use it swiftly. We've got to keep using it. In verse 16, Paul says, In all circumstances, take up the shield of faith. In all circumstances. There was no stage in a battle where a Roman soldier would just decide to put down his shield. Now, I've never held a shield uh, for any particular length of time, but I can imagine that your arm might get a little bit tired. But any good soldier knows that it's worth persevering through that kind of weariness because your life depends on it. Keep fighting to trust even when the circumstances around you may cause you to, to doubt, to doubt God, to doubt what he says, to doubt his promises. Chapter 11 in the book of Hebrews is known as the Faith Hall of Fame. Maybe you want to read that this week. It's a great chapter in the Bible on faith. It lists characters that are commended for their faith. And it's striking how many of them had to hang on to promises made to them by God for long periods of time before they saw breakthrough. Think of Abraham. He had to wait 25 years between God promising him descendants and him having a child. And he didn't just have to wait. Because of his old age and that of his wife Sarah, it seemed naturally impossible for God to fulfill his promise. But he did. God always does what he says he's going to do. Always. We're in a season right now that it requires huge amounts of perseverance. I know many of you are probably feeling, feeling weary. As Dan put it last week, you might be feeling like you just want to hibernate until this pandemic is over. But I want to encourage you to stay in the fight by using your shield of faith that God has given to you. Keep laying hold of the promises of God. Keep coming to him over and over again. Fill your minds with truth at every opportunity. And that may mean spending less time filling your mind with other things. I'm speaking to myself as much as anyone here. Make sure you regularly set time aside to spend with Jesus. He's the author and perfecter of your faith after all, isn't he? And we should be careful to surround ourselves with people who can speak faith into us when we can't do it for ourselves. Which brings me on to my final point. We must use the shield of faith together. I think we often read this passage about spiritual warfare, and we kind of have in our minds uh, a duel, like a one-on-one -on -one combat, like some sort of gladiatorial contest. In fact, I think far too often we read the New Testament and we just apply it to ourselves only as individuals. But m more often, much more often, the, the New Testament writers are writing to groups of people. They're writing to churches. You know, we are not designed to fight the fight of faith as lone rangers. Please don't try and do that. The Roman army used an incredibly effective technique in battle that they called tortoise formation, or testudo formation in Latin. And this is what it looked like. The shield becomes like a tortoise shell, or the shields together become like a one tortoise shell, protecting everyone from attack. I believe we are to use our shield of faith in this same way, not just to cover ourselves, but to protect and encourage one another. 
When a Roman army was facing a barrage of arrows, it would put the most vulnerable people, the, the lightly armed soldiers and the baggage animals and things like that, they would put them in the middle of the formation. And those with large shields, like the one we've been talking about today, they would surround them and protect them. This is a great picture of how church should function. And we all hit seasons where we're more vulnerable to enemy attack, and we just really need the support of other people. God has given you a, a church family so that we can speak faith into one another. I think we need this now more than ever. About 50 years before Paul wrote his letter to the Ephesians, the Roman army suffered one of its worst ever defeats in the Battle of the Teutoburg Forest in what's now modern day Germany. Three crack legions of, Roman, of Rome's army were wiped out. It was a complete disaster. And their big mistake was thinking that they were invincible. They didn't know the terrain, they didn't really know their enemy, and they took a route through dense forest. And the whole army became strung out on this narrow uh, path in just one long column. They allowed themselves to get isolated from one another. And they were unable to come together in this defensive formation, this tortoise formation, when they got ambushed. As I say, the results were disastrous. The enemy picked off soldiers one by one until there were none left. Because they couldn't fight together, they fell as individuals. As the people of God, let's not make this same mistake. We don't have to. In this pandemic, it's so easy to drift away from church community and to stop meeting with other believers. I know a small group on Zoom is hard going at times, but it's an opportunity for you to join shields with your brothers and sisters so that we can strengthen one another in God. I know that tuning into this live stream every week isn't how most of us would want church to be, but it's another way that we can come into this protective formation where we can be encouraged and built up and strengthened in God and receive from God. Not only that, but we can invite others into the formation as well. You might want to think this week, how can you build somebody else up in their faith? Could you arrange to meet someone for a, a walk or, or a coffee or, or just give somebody a call? Maybe somebody in your small group or someone that you know that's new to church. Maybe it's somebody that's having a, a difficult time right now get together or speak to one another by whatever means you can. Remind each other of the promises of God, his goodness and his faithfulness. Remind one another of your identity in Christ, the calling that he has on your lives. We can all lose sight of these things in this season and we need other people around us to help us. If you are somebody who needs help right now, you're just needing help, you're not in a good place, please reach out. Please reach out to other people. You are not on your own. God has given us what we need. He's given us the shield of faith that we're to use swiftly, continuously, and together. Let's take it up and use it. We live in hard times, don't we? Maybe you've been listening to me talking about the shield of faith that God gives us, and you know you don't have that because you're not yet a Christian. Well, you can have that today. You can come to God and ask him to clothe you with his armor, not only to see you through this season of life, but all the ups and downs in the future too. I want you to know that when we speak of the armor of God, we're not just talking about helpful techniques or strategies. We're talking about coming to a person, Jesus when we put on the full armor of God, and when we use the shield of faith, we are running into the arms of our Savior. He is the one who keeps us safe, and you can receive him today. If you'd like to do that, you can pray to God right now where you are, 
And I'd also love you to get in touch with me. You can email at hello at kingschurchedinburgh.org. That's on the screen just now. You can find details on the website as well. Please do get in touch. I'd love to talk to you more about this. Faith is the assurance that God will never let you slip out of his hand. If you are a Christian, you are his prized possession. You were bought at an unimaginably high price. You are his, and you will be with him forever. Right now, you are in a fight, but persevere with the absolute certainty that victory is guaranteed. Jesus will not only end this current pandemic, he also has the power to see you through whatever other challenges you might be going through. And even more precious than that, he promises that he's going to walk alongside you in the midst of those challenges. He's going to take care of you, even through death itself. He will never leave you. For now, take up the shield of faith, extinguish the fiery darts of the enemy. Stand firm in the wonderful victory of Jesus and his incredible love for you. I want to leave you with a verse for you to ponder and meditate on this week. It's from 1 John chapter 5, and it says, Everyone who believes that Jesus is the Christ has been born of God. And everyone who has been born of God overcomes the world. And this is the victory that has overcome the world. Our faith. Who is it then that overcomes the world except the one who believes that Jesus is the Son of God? Let's take up the shield of faith and sing. <laughs>